that's what I have. Yeah, that that part works great, actually. Um, but for some reason, it um, it worked. But then I I changed to a different app, and it apparently didn't work. And I just have my laptop assigned, my laptop mic signed for comms because that's all I really need. We're within five minutes, actually four minutes now, just crossed over. I was noting yesterday when the wind was pretty high here in San Diego, there's a kind of a passageway outside the window that's blocked behind me with those shutters. And there is a low frequency. I don't know. It's kind of somewhere between a low whistle and a whir that was really distracting to me. I didn't know if it was getting in the mic. It must have because I could hear it in real life. But it... So it's weird. I need to go build a baffle outside the window. Windy days. Maybe plant a big pine tree or something. Oh, that might make it worse. Wait a second. Can you like a, an acoustic scarecrow? Outside the window. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's another good name for a skiffle band. <laughs> right. Once did an early morning recording session where before every take, this was in a concert hall out in the middle of nowhere they had to fire off a starter's pistol to get the birds to go away <laughs> and you got a couple of minutes before they all came back to roost and make noise oh man yeah we used to have that problem with crickets in in uh, film studios and sound stages the crickets get into the walls behind that i padding. got 15 it's years of work to make them shut up out of the fact that there were crickets inside a store that the guy who had the gig before me didn't realize we're making all that noise so got in the soundtracks and they said try somebody else and I got called and again I worked for them for 15 years crickets are hard So Jeff, I'm and I'm throwing it right to you at the I'll just hand it off to you at the top of the next hour. Heard. Okay. And just to note, we have uh three Jeffs. Two Jeffs, technically one Jeffrey. Just just Get know where you are in the queue. That's the key. So if I say Jeff to answer a question, just know that just know which who who came. <laughs> We used to have a team with like three Kevins.
Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion about media and virtual production. Our second hour is uh, usually something we want to spend a little bit more time on. Today, we're going to talk about psychoacoustics, uh, basically how sound, how we perceive sound. And Jeff Francis is going to be leading that conversation. It's going to be a great second hour. So if you've got questions about psychoacoustics, uh, then definitely throw those into Makana. If you've got general questions, it's great to throw them in as early as possible even before the show. Before the show, we were uh, about a little after six, we were all like looking at the questions and asking, you know, sending out emails and or, or going on Discord and trying to figure those out. So your questions, the answers will be better if you ask those questions even before the show, before about 5.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, gives us a little bit more time to look at them, but you can ask them all the way through the show. I'd recommend adding a couple more right now. Um, let's go ahead and jump into the questions themselves. Uh, Bill, what do we have? Our first one comes from Hasma Gujar, a friend in Cape Town, South Africa, and he says, Teams, oh my word, a large mobile operator has asked me to manage some of their internal large meetings and or events, but they use Teams. Is it possible to execute what I do with Zoom ISO, Zoom Companion, and Stream Deck with Teams in the workflow? Go, Jeffrey. Uh, no, well, there is one thing you can make a change on, and that is uh, Epifan. Epifan has Epifan Connect which is similar to Zoom ISO. Uh, I don't know how much the, the difference is between the two, but uh, they came out, they rolled that out last month. You can give that a try, put that in your workflow and see if that helps. Yeah, the only thing I'd be concerned about is the FFAN's own rollout uh, event didn't didn't go very well. <laughs> so so we just, so I think that we, we want to be kind of careful of that. Uh, you know, they, they, they are putting together some good encoders, but it, it's, it's a pretty tricky thing. I think that the Teams is probably a couple of years behind uh, Zoom at the moment for that support. Remember that you're not going to get 1080p after the second person enters the, so you have two people can have, talking back and forth can have 1080p. As soon as the third person uh, jumps on, you're going to be at 720. Um, and people will claim 1080 on the outputs, uh, but if you put it up against the focus chart, it's uh, not. So so you're going to have a slightly lower, lower resolution than you'd have there. I don't think you have any of the tools that, that you would expect from Zoom OSC. So tying into the Stream Deck is going to be a lot harder. Um, you may be able to build some of that into an external switcher. So, you know, using a Mimo Live or just pulling those out. There are NDI outputs. So using vMix or, or Mimo or, or Ecamm, those might be ways that you can do some of these um, features. Um, so there are a fair number of NDI solutions that will just pull the raw outputs out of, out of uh, Teams. And so that might be something you want to look at. Next question. Next one comes to us from Aaron Gencarelli in uh, Flagstaff, Arizona. And he says, I'm wondering about the big differences between SDI and fiber. What's your inner insights working with these cables? Go ahead, Jeff. So uh, I had very little experience with fiber, and fiber was something I was terrified about as far as dealing with terminating fiber. But I was actually able to buy pre-terminated fiber and converters from SDI. And it was a pretty easy and fairly cheap installation to do uh, something longer than SDI would go to hook up some remote cameras. So I would uh, I would encourage you if you're not looking to get into fiber, you're a great deal. You can step into it in small doses. Good, Courtney. Yeah, generally fiber is much more expensive than SDI. It runs longer, uh, so if you have to have longer runs, it's more immune to uh, electromagnetic interference. So if you've got uh, something that has to run by some big motors or transformers or something that's going to generate a lot of EMI, uh, fiber is going to be your solution. Um, it's harder to distribute and to terminate. So if you, uh, you know, if you break a fiber to put a new connector on, requires specialized equipment and a person with specialized skills to re-terminate the end of that fiber. Fiber is much more fragile. So if you're running it uh, through any doorways or across any footpaths or Across anywhere where somebody's going to roll something over it with hard casters, it can ruin a very expensive long fiber. So take that in mind. If you're going to fly the fly your cables, fiber is a good choice. Uh, get it out of the way of people that can run over it and hurt it. Um, let's see. If you have to distribute, uh, you know, one signal to many different monitors or something, you're going to have to have specialized equipment that'll take the fiber in and then distribute to uh, SDI or HDMI, whatever your monitors are going to require. Uh, and, of course, there's a lot of cheap DAs that are available for SDI that you can have one in and ten out or something like that at your location if you need to, to split a signal into multiple others. So 
Uh, that's my take on it. And we we did um, also when you're connecting and disconnecting fiber, if you have like a camera that you're going to connect up to it and you're going to be pulling that connection and reconnecting that several times, any little speck of dust that gets on that connector or gets into the side of the, the camera side where that connects to uh, can create a problem with fiber. So you have to make sure you keep those connectors clean and they can be a little bit problematic there. Go ahead, Tom. And not just SDI, but USB. I'm using a 10 meter fiber cable right here in my setup with my uh, rack behind me. Yeah, and, and one of the things is you can put so much information into fiber. So one of the, you know, there's a company called IHSE that has the fiber connectors and you can put RS-232, uh, USB, all kinds of other things, and they'll bind that together and send it over fiber somewhere else. And so there's a lot of different ways that you can use it. Uh, I've used a lot of fiber. I think my last company, we probably had uh, almost 20 rolls of thousand foot fiber because we just, that's how we got out. If it was more than 75 feet, uh, well, m more than 150 feet. Uh, 75 was kind of where we started thinking about it. At 150 feet, we switched over to fiber. Um, and we could run easily 1,000 feet without thinking too much about it. Um, uh, we typically standardized on on TAC-12. So we buy a lot of TAC-12. You can get more. You can get TAC-24. Um, some people will go to TAC-4. As Courtney said, you have a tendency to break it. So you lose a strand. The reason we get TAC-12 is because we go, oh, that strand doesn't work. Let's go to another strand. <laughs> so, so, and it's not, it's incrementally more expensive to get TAC-12 than TAC-4. So it doesn't, it doesn't save you a lot to not, to, to not just go ahead and get all the strands. But the big thing is with TAC-12, you can send an enormous amount. We send Ethernet, you know, so we have a Dante network, a regular Ethernet network, a, um, uh, we have, you know, m multiple cameras going back and forth, signals going back and forth from a master control that might be, again, 600, 800 feet away. And it's one little cable. Now, we usually, when we say one little cable, we usually have two little cables um, going two different directions uh, through the venue to make sure that if one gets cut, um, we have something else. But it's a, it's, it's a very small cable that can go a long distance in a way that is pretty hard to do with, with, um, with uh, SDI. Uh, it is, you do need to, you know, we have a, repair box that we keep um, that that allows us to, you know, re-terminate if we need to and clean and so on and so forth. I'm a big fan of ST. ST is kind of a, it, it, it tends to look almost like a BNC, um, but the ST cables just tend to be something that it's easier for us to figure out what we're going to put into. LC tends to be a little bit more tweaky than ST, and, and I worry a little bit more about its termination. So, um, so take a look at that. You can get converters for all of them. So usually we have a bag that it just converts from, from all the things, L, LC, ST, SC, you know, those are all all versions of it. We have we can convert to any flavor from any flavor, typically on site. Um, next question. Next one comes to us from David Brady in New York City, and David says, "Looking for a low cost method to power six 12 volt Blackmagic design devices from a single power supply. The Legrand solution is nice but pricey. Hoping for an off the shelf solution." Good morning. Well, mm, a lot of these 12-volt uh, DC distribution devices are, are originally designed for a portable ENG work where, you know, everything has to be small and self-contained and battery-powered. Um, I'll show you a couple, and then uh, I think there are other people have some others that uh, are alternatives. These are not inexpensive, but um, <clears throat> true audio is one source. Uh, this is called the hot box. It has five uh, four pin XLR outputs and each one can carry six amps and it's around uh, 236 bucks. And what's the, um, each one can do six amps, but what's the total amperage on that, on that box? Usually that distro doesn't have, it's not, it's not like. Uh, 24 amps for the entire box. Okay, got it. Okay. Yeah. And then, uh, then they have the smaller version uh, called the BDS V4 for version four. Um, this uses uh, coaxial connectors, and uh, but this one is limited to three amps each output. Um, then there's um, cable techniques, which has uh, this one uses uh, Hiroshi connectors, and. Um, this one runs about $200. Each output is uh, rated at six amps. And with any of these, you can take the con con connector that they have there, of course, and convert it to the connector that you need. Uh, right. Both of these companies um, provide, uh, well, you can buy 
different jumper cables with different connectors for different types of equipment. So here's one showing uh, the uh, <clears throat> uh, XLRs, and mm -hmm. there are several other Lots cables. You can look through their websites. I'll put the websites for both of these companies in Mukana. In, um, Mukana yeah. That's great. Courtney? Yes, and for the cheap solution... Always come to Courtney. Uh, <laughs> uh, I use uh, these for powering LED lights and for multiple modules. Uh, they're uh, designed for closed-circuit TV surveillance cameras that require 12 volts. This includes the 12-volt uh, uh, power supply uh, that has uh, up to 7 amps output So, and, it's, and a splitter for 1 to 8 uh, connectors that are 2.1, uh, you know, the uh, these type of... Uh, Connectors, which I think fit the uh, Blackmagic uh, or the uh, decimators, uh, and will provide you 12 volts at a sufficient amperage when you're dividing it by five uh, to give you at least one amp out per each one of those. However, it doesn't protect you. There's no individual, uh, you know, regulation that goes on each one. It's total regulated out for 12 volts. Uh, but if you have one module that's shorted out or something, it could affect the others that are paralleled across it. But uh, generally, they worked. I haven't had any problems with mine. Go ahead, Jeffrey. And then a mid-range is uh, guitar. There's uh, what's called guitar distribution power blocks. Uh, you can get them. Uh, most of them are 9 volt, but you can get some 12 volt. It really depends on the amps that you need from there. Uh, I think if, if you, you can get up to two uh, ones that have 250 uh, milliamp uh, power uh, distribution on there. So if that works on that, all you have to do is make sure that the uh, cans will fit in and work into the uh, black magic boxes. But you can also get uh, replacements and, and do a little bit of soldering to uh, fix that as well. Go ahead, Courtney. One thing I forgot to mention, the stuff that uh, Marty presented, uh, I don't think any of those actually included the source of power. So you're going to have to have your own 12-volt source of power, either a power you know that can deliver 5 or 7 amps, the switching power supply, or a DC power supply like a 12-volt battery or a lithium-ion lithium battery that can provide 12 volts to those BDS systems. Next question. Next one comes to us from Scott Mueller in Germantown, New York. And Scott says, where does Dante Video stand in relation to NDI? Is anyone implementing Dante Video in their setups? I have not seen anybody implement that. <laughs> they have certification processes. They talk about it. It makes sense. It makes sense for them to say, well, you're already using Dante Audio and you should you know, providing something, especially people who are comfortable with Dante, to give them an, an, an another way to manage their video makes sense on paper. The problem is, is a lot of people are embedded into either copper or NDI, or some of them are thinking about 2110. It, it seems like a crowded market for Dante to get into. Um, they might be successful. I think it's more about supporting the ecosystem that they already have and not necessarily, um, you know, trying to make it the next NDI. If you're already using Dante, this is a, a way for you to add video to it. Um, but I haven't, we've, it's been out for years now and I've ne I have not run across it once. So, so, um, you know, it may be a, a pretty hard path that they've taken there. And I think a lot of it is a lot of people that are using Dante are also using NDI. And, um, and so they're, they're, they're already embedded, you know, so to speak. So it's, it's, it, it might work out over time, but it seems like a lot of us were just like, huh. <laughs> like, you know, like the, I'd, I'd rather have them focus on making sure all my Dante stuff, my audio works than, than have them spend a lot of resources on, uh, video. Next question. Next one comes to us from Jeff Francis in Columbia, South Carolina. Blackmagic Design Hyperdeck Studio Mini Audio. If two channels, audio is seen by Final Cut Pro 10, QuickTime, and Resolve. If 16 channels, the audio is seen by Resolve, but not by Final Cut or QuickTime. Solutions. So just a little that. more explanation. This is uh, the Hyperdeck Studio Mini recording H.264. Uh, um, and so you have three options on the audio. You have two channel PCM, you have two channel AAC, and you have 16 channel. It'll pull all 16 channels from the SDI input. Mm -hmm. And I went and I switched from uh, medium to high on the H.264. And it, uh, I didn't notice that it flipped to 16 channel. So I recorded something, popped it in, looked at the file in QuickTime, no audio. Does not even show an audio track. Loaded it into Final Cut does not show an audio track. It yeah. does show in Resolve. 
So is there a plugin or something for the Mac and Final Cut that allows it to see that 16 channel audio track? Yeah, there is a plugin. It's called uh, Resolve. <laughs> like, you know, that's the plugin that makes it work. It's free. You can download it. Um, here's here's what here's the issue is. I don't think that that, that standard wrapper supports um, 16 channels. And so I think when you say I want to record 16 channels, it's building a custom wrapper that Resolve knows what's to lo- what what's what to do with, and nothing else does. So the reason it's not showing up is because I think it's probably considered inside the wrapper a sidecar solution because I believe that that the H.264 um, you know format usually needs to do that. You you know the way that that's typically recorded, or at least the way it's read. It's not that it can't exist in the format, but the way it's read is for stereo. You know, it's expecting two channels. If you add more channels to it, uh, I believe that nothing else is going to read it other than Resolve. I think what it's what Blackmagic has done is build a custom way to pack more channels into it that nobody else is using. You know, that's the, so I think that you would have to pass that through. I think to get it into something else, you need to pass it through Resolve and export it back out again. <laughs> so, so I think that that's the solution. Go ahead, Jeff. So this is my warning to everyone not to panic when you put your SD card in and you don't see any <laughs> audio tracks. There's audio there. You just right. have to use Resolve to get it. Yeah, and and I think that you know Blackmagic is one of the few companies that can do what they do with that, where they go, well, we're just going to build a custom, something that our stuff can read. It is frustrating for folks that are using other things. Um, I, I'm used to the... What's interesting is what got me into Resolve uh, at first was just because I was recording lots of Blackmagic RAW and it wasn't being supported by Final Cut. So I just started opening up. I had to download Resolve to make the conversions um, and and then it, you know, it grew from there. But, but I think that that's the, um, uh, you know, I think that they're just doing, they want to get what they want out of it without having to be constrained by the spec. You know, that's, that's what they're, they're kind of doing is adding a feature there. So yeah, you're, you're right. Uh, know that if you did 16 channels, just make sure to open it resolve. Next question. Ja, Graham, Graham Cardwell in Belfast, Northern Ireland is up next. Some of my staff are getting some Photoshop training soon. I have no need for Photoshop at work, so I won't have a license and IT won't approve a trial download. Are there any free web packages I can use to play along at a very basic level? And he says Pixlr, which is P-I-X-L-R, looks good. Any others? I go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, uh, so one I'll mention is uh, Photopea, that's photopea.com, a lot of features. Uh, I will say, um, depending on if you're a Mac, and if if I understand the question correctly, that IT won't approve a trial download. Um, If you're on a Mac, I'll reiterate something Alex mentioned probably a few years ago that has stuck with me, which is uh, Pixelmator for the Mac um, is phenomenal for most people, uh, has all the functionality one could need. Uh, very, very um, uh, inexpensive, 50 bucks, if I'm not mistaken, for the pro license on the Mac, uh, I think. And, and I don't want to speak for you, Alex, but I think Alex mentioned at the time that anyone that's new that's not coming in as a Photoshop expert um, can just do that. I've recommended it to clients. They're very happy with it, including some folks that uh, were fairly seasoned Photoshop people, but didn't want to or couldn't buy a new license. So really good if you can install something and if you're on a Mac, but uh, otherwise there are some good. The only other thing I'll caution with with web graphics packages, if it's in a work context, I mean, you have to be mindful of what kind of things you're working on. You know, if it's proprietary collateral from clients, you know, or, are they okay with you putting them on these platforms? Something to be mindful of. Yeah, the um, uh, uh, Pixelmator is great. Uh, I use Affinity Photo now, from, probably more for for it. it. It feels a little bit more like Photoshop. Um, it's still both of them are going to be not the Photoshop pipeline. So if you're doing a Photoshop training, you're going to have a hard time keeping up um, on anything other than Photoshop. Now, Photoshop, remember, you can do a 30 day trial as well for yourself, and then just cancel it. Um, so that's not that's not that hard if you're able to bring an extra computer. Um, but you will have a hard time. The, all the tools work a little differently. Um, I use the reason I use Affinity Photo is actually because it has Affinity. There's a there's another drawing program and everything else, and so I'm kind of trying to replace the whole Adobe suite with those those um, features. And we started doing that when the subscription started, <laughs> pretty much uh, for for. And it's mostly because I 
uh, at the time I had 30 computers and I was, I looked at the cost of subscription to support all those computers. And I felt like I should just install first Pixelmator and then Affinity Photo um, on those. And then we only had a handful of, we still had a handful of Photoshop files because you get Photoshop files or you get something that's specific. The main thing you give up with Photoshop, I, I believe with these, is some of the high-end compositing tools that Photoshop has are of course not in the smaller ones. And also uh, you, you give up the channel operations. So all the being able to really look at and manage your alpha channels along with your individual RGB channels is just harder, much harder in the other apps. It's just that they've taken on a different approach to that. And if, as a Photoshop user, it's pretty painful, you know, so, so when you, when you're used to doing some really high end compositing and extraction, it's much harder to do in, in those, but for basic operations and basic um, stuff, I think that the Pixelmator and, and, and they're much faster than Photoshop. They, they, they take advantage of a new architecture. So I use Affinity Photo probably 80% of the time and Photoshop for the other 20% that I just need the tools that are there. Um, go ahead, Jeffrey. So what not to do is uh, they do have Photoshop elements. Uh, don't buy yeah, that yeah, and buy use that. that instead because it's uh, photo, Photoshop is a pixel editor where, where Photoshop elements is a photo editor. And, the, and that, that's the big difference. You won't have all the features on there. Depending on how you have the licenses set up, there's a chance that because a license, uh, an individual license means that you can put it on two computers as long as you're not running it at the same time. So if you work with somebody, you could possibly do that. Or you could talk to your uh, company about having one license as a loaner, which you would then put on your computer, and then you'd log in and then log off as you as you did that. And on that same token, I know that there's some libraries across the nation that do have uh, simple Photoshop licenses that you can uh, check out. And of course, you have to return it, but then you can uh, do some te uh, testing there. Go ahead, Courtney. Well, if you're just looking for a, uh, a cheap uh, photo editor, you know, GIMP is always uh, a choice. Uh, it's open source. They have a new version that works on uh, Apple, uh, new silicon, uh, and it it's also works on Windows and, and Linux. It is not, uh, it does most of the things that Photoshop can do, although the interface, the user interface is not the same. So it has a fairly steep learning curve as far as learning the interface. And so if you're going to be following along with training, uh, Photoshop training, it's not going to work for you. But if you need something to do the same tools, it's free. You can put it on as many computers as you want. It's open source and cross-platform. So look for GIMP, G-I-M-P. Okay. Next question. Next one comes to us from Eric Billings in Washington, D.C. And Eric says, I'd like to explore ultra-high frequency recordings. And he notes 20 kilohertz to 96 kilohertz. But I'm not excited about the prices of those specialty microphones. Does the panel know of any regular mics that can reliably record high frequencies above 20 kilohertz off-label? This is for a hobby, not a professional, John. Go ahead, Marty. Uh, short answer, no. <laughs> it, it takes a lot. It takes a lot of engineering and precision manufacturing to make a microphone that is going to reproduce audio that high frequency cleanly in phase. The only two microphones that I know of that will record above 20K are um, from Earthworks Audio. Um, they have two microphones, one for measurement, one for audio recording that go up to 50K. Um, and this guy runs about 1300 bucks. And then there's the Sanken Audio. Uh, CUX 100K goes up to 100 kilohertz. This guy is about 3400 bucks. Go ahead, Courtney. Well, if you don't have 3400 bucks, it depends on what you're going to be doing with this microphone. You said it's really for a hobby. Um, not sure if you're going to be recording uh, birds or uh, crickets or something like that. The problem is uh, both the microphone and your audio channel, what are you going to plug them into? Uh, because most uh, preamps that are designed for microphones uh, cut off, uh, have a kind of a brick wall filter up at around 20,000. So you're not going to get very far with most recording software unless it's especially designed to record high frequency audio. I did find this online from Dodotronic for about uh, available in Europe for I think that's not $350,000. I think that's 350 euros. 
uh, that is a, a USB microphone, and it has an app that runs on uh, iOS or Android that it plugs into and allows you to record, I think, up to 50,000 hertz. It's designed for high-frequency recording. Uh, and is a USB, so that might be a solution for you if you're looking to experiment, and I think their app has a recorder built into it that will uh, allow it to record those higher frequencies, and they come in over USB, so you don't have to deal with uh, audio preamps uh, in your audio chain that may be cutting off your high frequency. Yeah, and the um, uh, the Sankin also makes a CO, CO100K, which I think you can buy. I don't know if they're still selling it, but I think you can buy it at like Vintage King or something for $2,000, $2,500, bucks, something else like that. It's a little bit a little bit different than the CUX100K. Uh, the I, I, I feel your pain, though, because I keep circling this. I so, When I see samples of what people are doing with them, which is a lot of times it's also stretching stretching out the audio or slowing it down and doing a lot of other things just creates incredible effects and just incredible like someone showed how they built like a lion roaring just by them just going Arr, you know like in, and then and then slowing it all down i i it's like a the two things that i really want there is that and a phantom camera and i you know i think i think i could probably just build a youtube channel around those two things um go ahead courtney oh well, one thing i also was going to mention is there's there's another uh, site called uh Avisoft for uh, recording wildlife sounds, and they have ultrasonic microphones for bioacoustics. Uh, they're f a little bit more pricey. I think uh, they were in the twelve hundred dollar range mm -hmm. or, or twenty seven hundred euros. So, no, that's probably out of your price range. But if that's what you're looking to record, the other solution might be uh, ultrasonic transducers, which you can get on Amazon pretty cheaply. Um, you know, that have a transmitter and a receiver. And if you're a, a bit of a DIYer, you could uh, hook up that transducer and, and build an a, a to D converter that'll handle those frequencies. Not sure what you're going to be using it for in your hobby. Though. Yeah, and, and and the thing, the the other thing to remember is that you can always rent these. <laughs> so you may you may you may look at this and go, well, I can't afford it, but you could possibly rent it for a lot less money. And think about how often you're going to use it. Uh, I'm probably going to rent one soon because I just want to see what it, what I can do with it. <laughs> like I just I can't like when I I look at what other people are doing with it, and I think I'm going to rent it for a week and just play with it, and maybe we'll. I'll post a bunch of stuff that people can play with to see if it if it's worth it. Um, but it's it's really it's very tempting. Um, next question. Steve Uroff in Madison, Wisconsin is up next. While recording macros for my Ata Mini yesterday, I got it in a state where the only pro responding physical buttons were the picture and picture group, yet the software camera selection still worked. I had to power cycle it to fix it. What would you think this would be? A misunderstood configuration state, a bug, or something else? Yeah, macros, when you start making really complex macros, one of the problems with the macros in general in the ATEM is that you can get it into a, an unknown state because you're asking to do so many things so quickly. Um, and so the so I think that that's the thing you have to do. And, and it's, you, you can pull it in a bunch of different directions all at the same time. Um, and so it is, you have to, and, and the problem with it is, is it's the fact that you have to touch everything that you want it to, to do or it'll ignore those things. Um, and so you can you can do a lot of, it, it doesn't do any damage, but it may require a restart um, to make those things work. What I would recommend, depending on what you're trying to do with those macros, is see how much you can do in MixEffect Pro um, because it is um, far more advanced. Like it literally, I don't even know why someone owns an ATEM without a Mix, Mix Effect Pro as a software controller because it's, it is, it changes the the quality of what the, what the ATEM can do dramatically. Um, and it's not, it's not a minor update. Um, so, I would highly recommend looking at that, if, especially if you're trying to do these macros to get super sources, um, which I find to be almost unusable on the vanilla version of the ATEM. Uh, next question. Luther Kart Friedrich in Easterberg, Germany is up next. He says, birddog.play or my connected TV don't offer analog audio out. What uh, CLD could be a solution to get wired analog audio from the NDI source? Uh, go ahead, Marty. Um, yeah, so you're going to need to de-embed the audio from the HDMI signal somehow. Uh, now, BirdDog has other converters. They're on the more expensive price points uh, that will have the embedders built into them. Or you can get um, 
a standalone de-embedder from a variety of places that will extract audio and just look for the one that has as many audio channels as you want to extract from the HDMI. If you're doing multi-channel audio, you want to make sure you can get all of those analog outputs. Yeah, and a simple stereo will be not very much, tens of dollars. Uh, if you want all 16 channels out of a surround, a 916, um, that's, you're getting into four or $5,000 for an AVR that has XLR outs. So it just depends on, on what scale you need coming out of those, uh, that HDMI signal. Next question. Mickey Makachor, our friend in Manila in the Philippines, has the next question. Looking to get more mics on stands ready to go in the studios. He currently uses an Atlas SB36W Classic Boon stand, but space is at a premium. Are there any recommendations for a smaller footprint boom stand that can carry heavier tube microphones and stereo pairs? Go ahead, Jeff. I'd probably take a look at Latch Lake stands. Now, I wouldn't want to carry these around, but if they're going to stay in the studio, Latch Lake has these. And what's one of the awesome things about them is that their feet fit together, so you can actually fit those mics a lot tighter. And you, they have all kinds of accessories to put multiple mics onto one stand. Go ahead, Marty. Yeah, exactly. The uh, the Latch Lake was uh, going to be my first recommendation, um, and they're heavy duty stands. They they come with a you know, couple of different kinds of bases, as you as you need. And uh, with uh, these clamps that attach to the shaft, uh, you can do multi mic, um, you know, different kinds of microphones, multiple microphones on a single stand. But the company that has taken these adaptabilities to the next level is uh, Triad Orbit. Uh, they really have uh, developed uh, many, many different kinds of adapters uh, to put microphones on different places, multiple microphones. You can put three, four microphones all from the top of the stand using these uh, multi-point adapters. So uh, they get pretty complex and, and also you're paying for the for the intellectual property <laughs> and development well, cost. I wouldn't even say that you're paying for the intellectual property. You're also paying for the build quality. The the Triad Orbit stuff is just top notch. Um, I have been I've been able to destroy a Triad Orbit tri, tri, tripod over time, but it took a couple continents, uh, you know, of of movement to 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 wear it out. So um, it's they're amazing, amazing pieces of machinery. Um, next question. Andy Kokendorfer is up next from VR Florida, and he says, client demands a large physical whiteboard in the presentation room. Is there an acoustically treated whiteboard? Go ahead, Courtney. Not that I know of, because the way whiteboards work is it's a non-porous surface that's putting a, uh, a uh, powder-based uh, color on there that's uh, in an alcohol ink, so it, it evaporates quickly. And you can erase it by just brushing something across it. So if it were a porous surface that would be treated for less sound reflection, it, it wouldn't be able to erase very well. So I think your best bet is to put up a regular whiteboard and tilt it at a slight angle so that it's not parallel to any other, other reflective surfaces in the room. Put it out about you know three or four degrees from the top, tilt it down a little bit. And that'll help some of your standing wave problems. But I think that's the only way to, to get a whiteboard that's actually erasable that works. Yeah. And the other thing to think about is, remember, what you're really hearing are reflections bouncing around the room. So treat the rest of the room. So you can give them a, give them a, uh, a big whiteboard, but then soften up everything else in the room. Um, it windows. And, and, and the problem is, is that the design of, you know, the design of, of these uh, rooms was built to how they look because that's what you can see when you're giving someone a design, like you're going, this is what it'll look like and it'll be pretty and it'll be shiny and it'll have lots of windows and, and boards everywhere. And, and no one was thinking about the audio and the audio kind of works when you're in it. Um, I, I, I find it to be a little bit too echoey, even when I'm sitting in, in the conference room, but when you're, what, what's happened for, and I think that there's a huge change happening right now when we talk to some of the, our partners that everybody's rethinking it because the executives didn't care until they were were remote. But when they meet with people that are in the conference room, they're like, what happened to the conference room? Nothing happened to the conference room. You, it's been, and then when they find out it's been that way the whole time, lots of people, there's lots of meetings. Uh, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, um, exactly what I was going to say in terms of treating the room to compensate. I assume if you're asking the question, maybe that's a problem. And the other one, which is half, 
kidding, half not, which is one of those big easels with paper. You know, paper won't be reflective, but it is paper, not a whiteboard, if the need is specifically a whiteboard. Otherwise, those paper slabs work great. And you can build things that are more, everything from something a little bit softer in the room to the most extreme versions are, you know, you basically have the, the your, 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 um, your infrastructure and then you have um, cloth over, over things that people are really considering this more and more seriously where it looks nice and smooth on the walls, but it's literally two or three inches of diffusion that's in the walls um, that are there. You should have to protect, get people not to touch the walls. <laughs> they can go through them pretty quickly, but it dramatically changes the quality of the sound uh, in the room. Um, next question. Next one comes to us from Douglas Carmichael, and he says, with the U.S. and Canadian governments banning TikTok on government-issued devices, do you think social media professionals should deprioritize TikTok in their social media mix? I go ahead, uh, Jeff. It's a little early to, to know what the fallout will be from that. I mean, right now it is government devices. So if your audience for that client is government workers, well then, yes, that's meaningful. Otherwise, it's a little early to know if it'll have an effect with the, with the rest of the folks that use TikTok. And, and quite frankly, it could have the opposite effect, which is, well, now it's really risky and bad. So, you know, younger folks may really flock to it and, and double down. So as an advertiser, you're going after where your audience is. So if they are going to stay there, if not uh, use it even more because it's naughty now, then that's where you want to be, regardless of, of what the government devices are doing with their policies. Go ahead, Jeffrey. The biggest problem is that your data is going over to China and at any point in time, the uh, the China's authoritarian, author, I can't say it, their government is, uh, could ask for that data and collect that data or other, uh, there's other ways that, uh, in China that people could get the data. There was a little concern that they could even get passwords, but I think that that's been debunked uh, since there. But I suppose if somebody had time, and going through encryption that they could they could hack it just like anybody else. But those are the reasons why government's looking to uh, to ban it on government devices. There's no need for them to to have it on those government devices anyway. They're not they're not gonna be doing dances on TikToks or anything like that. If they need to do it, uh, they can do it on their personal devices. There's also been an issue of mental health, but uh, that's the underlying, but it should be the, uh, the main cause, but the, it is an underlying cause as well. Uh, for you to take it off the off your uh, phone. I mean, the, 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 I think the biggest uh, thing that, that TikTok does that, that that China has been able to project is a loss of productivity <laughs> because everybody's use, using it or watching it. Uh, you know, it takes so long. You know, those little TikToks that you see that look really simple, they take a long time to make. I make some of those uh, for other people mostly, a couple for my kids, and um, they, it's it's a project. And so if you, you see someone producing lots of these, and you're like, wow, that's a lot of work. So that's all work that they could have been doing something productive. Instead, they're putting on TikTok. Uh, I definitely don't think we're going to see any any pullback as long as the um, the meme with the unbearable weight of massive talent continues uh, with Pedro Pascal. If you haven't seen those, just do a search for TikTok unbearable weight of massive talent. It's about every third TikTok right now. <laughs> I've never seen any meme go as far as it has. Um, I, you know, I think that there are one of the things that we're talking about with passwords is um, a lot of your apps will routinely look at the clipboard. And so the, and the reason that they do that, a lot of times people say, well, why are they looking at the clipboard? The reason they look at the clipboard is because they want to keep people, bots from basically, if you want to jam a system with comments or jam things or, or do other hacks, um, you can use the, you can copy and paste things in that you couldn't necessarily, that would be hard. It would be inefficient to type. And as a result, um, it, it they, uh, almost every device that you have looks at your clipboard. And the reason that that's important is if you copy and paste a password, it's sitting in your clipboard when that device looks for it. And so you have to be very careful of copying and paste. If, you, if you're moving a password, you need to copy and paste something else right after you move that password. Don't go into any app um, in, in general. If you're coming out of, out of something into another thing, as soon as you do that, copy and paste something else so that you, you clear that cache because Many, many, many apps do it because it's a way, a back door to do other bad things. And so it's, the, the reasoning for that is reasonable, but they are grabbing onto your pass, passwords and that's a, that's a risk. So always know if you're going to cut and paste on your mobile device, make sure, or on any device, make sure that you clear that cache immediately. Next question. 
Our next one comes from Keely Dunn in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. In ClickUp's Level Up 3.0 event yesterday, they announced AI integration that includes summarizing docs and projects. What AI integration would you like to see in your production software that would make your lives easier? Good, Courtney. I don't know if you'd call it AI integration, but maybe someone could write this app. Uh, I could do it, but I'm not going to. Is that uh, timing? Timing purposes and some of these some of these script handling uh, programs designed for news broadcasts have this built in. But what you could do is have an app that uh, let's say you've got a, a, an event with seven you know seven or eight presenters, and each of them are going to be submitting their own scripts that they're going to deliver in front of an audience. Uh, and you're not going to get those scripts maybe till the last minute or you don't know when. Um, just have a app that would send them a little block of text that they read in, and it would time them reading that particular little block of text and determine their reading speed. And then when they submit their scripts in, the uh, AI would go through your whole presentation of every person's script that they're going to be presenting and do a timing breakdown of how long each of their speeches should take so that you can time your event and know if everybody's going to fit in the allotted time, especially if it's going to be broadcast with a fixed time limit. So, and they could even do a, a time-coded uh, breakdown that you send out to all everyone so that they know at 12.07, we should be about here in the script, and these are the slides that are going to be coming up next. So it could do a, a time-coded rundown of the whole show based on the actual reading speeds of the individual presenters. That would be cool. Good, Jeff. One thing I'll throw out that, that Courtney actually touched on um, is, is just a reminder for everyone to be... Um, cautious consumers, you know, everyone is throwing the AI label in their marketing materials. Uh, not everything is AI, as Courtney mentioned, but, you know, a couple things that, that I would love to see and, and uh, from recording voiceover, Descript actually does some of these things. I, I haven't jumped into their, um, their pool yet. Um, but in other words, even some of the script handling, if I could load a script into my DAW and, and have it kind of lay it out for me, almost like a karaoke style, uh, so I can kind of read along right in the timeline just by putting the script in there would be cool. Not necessarily AI, but if it starts making suggestions, recommendations for breaks and things like that. And, and then on the reverse, what Descript does do, and this is definitely AI, uh, which is if, if I flub one word or something like that, if it can correct that plosive or something like that in a very intelligent way, um, that's promising and that will happen. So I'm looking forward to some of those features. Yeah, I think I will admit that I think that most people would benefit from AI rewriting most of their scripts. You know, so, um, you know, the, the, the people keep on saying, why is ChatGPT sound so sure of itself? It sounds so sure of itself when it's, when it's doing these things. It's because it's using active verbs. So it's using, it's, it's using a proper strunk and white style approach to writing. And that writing is much more powerful. It is much more compelling than the garbly gook that comes out of most people's mouths when they do presentations with lots of passive verbs, um, you know, lots of, you know, run on sentences, lots of things that people do because they're not, I don't, I don't know. I don't know why they do that. So anyway, so that's the the thing that um, that that most people would benefit. So when I write something that I have to do, I write it and then I literally do what I call a strunk and white pass, which is I go through and I viciously try to get rid of every single passive verb, you know, is, was, anything to be, you know, all those things I try to get rid of. And I just go through it and it's a hard work. It's like you have to restructure every single sentence to get rid of all of those because those are bad English, <laughs> like you know, so you know, like and it's it's weak English, um, and and uh, the and Chat GPT gets rid of those most of those almost immediately, um, you know, and so that's why it sounds so much stronger. So I think a lot of people would benefit from it. Just just put your script in and say rewrite this properly or rewrite this in a more active state, and it'll probably rewrite the whole thing and it'll probably sound better than the original. Uh, go ahead, John. If I was to guess, this is an integration to to uh, open AI's API because yeah. it would be it's super easy to integrate it's about 15 lines of code yeah yeah so so I think that 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 would probably be the biggest thing uh, that I that I would look at one of the things that we're looking at somewhere in the future is when you're managing questions to use AI to group them together and figure out which ones you know are similar to each other etc and not at the volume that we have here but at higher volume systems it would be useful uh, next question 
Douglas Carmichael's up next, and he's curious as to what Ross expressions can do that SPX, as we use it here on Office Hours, can't do. It's a different. It's a, it's it's really not fair to compare the two. Ross is a twenty thousand dollar piece of software that is used in broadcast and used in arenas, used in a lot of things. And SPX is not. You know, you, it doesn't cost anything <laughs> like you, you you development costs money but it's not so you know ross has a lot of um a lot of logic a lot of scripting a lot of it has a 3d engine built into it um its ability to integrate with lots and lots of external devices um is really mature um it's really built as a core of a broadcast system so there's just tons of workflows and integrations that ross is just going to be automatic and so um i think that you have a lot of flexibility with SPX. You have it's obviously very cost effective. Uh, we found it to be, you know, really, really flexible and able to build it. And I think that, in some ways, it's it can be more flexible than Ross in in, in certain areas. But if you're doing traditional broadcast, Ross is one of two or three. Uh, the Ross Expression system is probably one of two or three ones that we see all the time. Chiron, uh, VizRT, uh, Expression. I mean, those are the those are the big ones. Like I barely ever see any other ones when people start talking about doing live graphics, um, you know, when, you know, for a standard broadcast. But I think SPX has been a, a, the perfect solution for what we're doing, especially because Tuomo's around. <laughs> so, so for, so, and, and, and for a lightweight, less expensive, very flexible system, I think SPX is, has been um, a perfect solution for what we're doing. Um, and, um, and so I think that, that it, it's just two different worlds that we're trying to solve. Uh, next question. David Brady's up next from New York City. In a recent Zoom event, we were streaming out to our content distribution network. Pre-event music was playing through Playback Pro. When monitoring the stream, the music seemed to slow down and then speed up without changing pitch. What might be the cause? Go ahead, Jeffrey. Uh, packet stretching or packets and buffering, basically. We, we see this all the time in Zoom. If somebody's got a bad connection and they start talking, and all of a sudden they start sounding slowed down and then they then all of a sudden they start speeding up so they can uh, catch up to what it is because it has the, the information has to go more than one direction and it has to do it uh, concurrently. So most likely that the, the I, I'm not, I've never used this Playback Pro, but most likely this pa Playback Pro is going somewhere that it has to keep that consistency going. Go ahead, Courtney. Well, David, that's what they call jazz. <laughs> you know, it doesn't maintain a constant beat, you know, it's variable. No, but <laughs> seriously, what it may be a problem is the difference between constant bitrate and variable bitrate compression. Uh, MP3 offers both, and other types of compression offer either constant bitrate or variable bitrate. And it's using one into the other. You know, if your playback software is using variable bitrate and your CDN requires constant bitrate uh, delivering the two, it will vary the speed to match the constant bitrate going out. So you'll, it'll pitch correct, so it'll sound like uh, the samples are going out at, at varying different rates because it was a variable bitrate compressed and going out at a constant bitrate. So that may be the cause. So check your, check the encoding of your uh, sound files and see if... and convert them to whatever your CDNs require. Yeah, I mean, we see it pretty common in everything, Skype, Zoom, Teams, everything. If you get a slow connection, as, as Jeffrey said, said you'll, it'll slow down and then it'll speed up because it's trying to retime it to get it back in there. So you're, what you're hearing definitely is a, a connection issue. Typically, it's not your connection issue at the receive end. It's the, it's the connection issue at the transmit end. So it's someone who has a, or for some reason has a slower connection um, it can also be exacerbated by um, what's funny is, is that you want not very many moving pixels, but you, you, you rarely want no moving pixels. No moving pixels changes the way it manages compression. And sometimes you can see that it, it'll change how it, how the audio works um, in some rare instances. And so you have to be careful of usually want something moving a little bit to, to do a, uh, basically a heartbeat for it sending it out. Otherwise, it goes to a different state. Um, we haven't seen that as much recently, but it has been a problem in the past of running stills with music underneath it across WebRTC. Um, next question. Stan Chan in San Francisco, California. Up next, after upgrading one of my Mac minis to an M2 Pro, running my Apollo X8 rack using UA's MIDI control and a Korg Nano control, my status lights stopped working. Buttons still function. Are there any ideas why? Yeah, 
I, I'm assuming that you had Intel before this, and it's probably libraries that aren't written um, natively in the in the M series, and so uh, or and not properly connected there. So, you might want to look back and see if they have any compatibility issues or warnings across that hardware as to whether it is um, it is properly and fully supporting uh, the the M the M pla the M series platform. Um, but we still see some anomalies as you as you move forward both in the os and as well and these are third-party hardware manufacturers that just haven't been able to keep up with um a pretty radical change in how it how the um how a lot of these things are managed next question chris widener lafayette indiana rice back uh, comes back with has anyone tried an external wi-fi adapter on an ipad pro uh go ahead uh, jeff haven't tried that specifically. I was hoping someone might jump in that's tried that exact thing. But I will say uh, I've just always loved the uh, almost kind of hidden fact that you can plug most USB compliant devices into any iOS device. Um, uh, you know, you can plug a full powered USB hub, you know, so I have a little kind of mobile setup for my iPhone, by the way, not even iPad, um, with a little uh, powered USB hub. And then you can plug, I mean, you can plug keyboard, mouse. Um, the, the one thing I wanted to point out when you're testing this, the key um, is these dongles, uh, you know, for that one you need, of course, um, the USB-C, uh, but if you're going to a traditional USB, um, get the Apple one and also keep uh, these generic off Amazon ones because, and I keep both everywhere, because some things won't work with the real Apple dongle, but they will work with third party and vice versa. So always keep uh, one of each. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Uh, not a actual Wi-Fi, it, uh dongle but i what i have done is i've tethered my phone and that becomes its own uh wi-fi into the into the phone i've also have the uh gl inet which is the little travel router which uh, if i use a usb ethernet i can plug that into the router and then the router can then uh, go and connect up to a different wi-fi uh, hotel wi-fi or to my phone or whatever yeah and um the uh, anything that looks like Ethernet to, to the to the will work. So if it's coming in and says this is a data point that's coming in as an adapter, and it, most likely your Wi-Fi will will look like that to it, and it'll just connect to it. Next question. Uh, from the panel here, Marty Adius in Maryland says, I've got my Wacom One tablet working, but I can't get lines to draw under the pen. What Good, should Marty. I look for? What are, you, what are you doing there, Marty? Well, so I'm I'm using this with a PC, and I've tried a couple of different drawing programs, and I've calibrated the pen on the tablet um, <clears throat> and I've got the drawing program full screened on one monitor and I've got my um, video image on the tablet. Uh, when I draw, depending on which part of the screen I'm on, uh, sometimes the, the lines are just not under the pen and they could be, if, I, if I'm looking at the drawing program and I draw to the left edge of that, the pen is about three inches to the inside. So when I'm drawing three inches, when I put the pen down three inches from the left edge of the tablet, for example, the line is at the left edge. So it's just not lining up. Oh, it's a scaling issue. And you have the driver connected to it? Yes. And did you do the calibration with it? I did. And it's still... Um... And you did the calibration in the current state that you had. You didn't plug a new monitor in. You didn't, you're not mirroring something else. You're, because what happens a lot of times is that you calibrate it. And then if anything changes it, uh, it will get out of calibration. Mm -hmm. um, if I take the, if I take the drawing program and I put it on the tablet. It works. Let me try this. And I full screen it. And then... And I get it here, okay. That might seem to work. Yeah. So, so what's happening is, is that the the res the it's effective resolution of the monitor that you're mirroring, uh, if you're mirroring a monitor, and the resolution of the and and how it's set up for the tablet are probably different, and so it's not mapping directly. So that's probably the solution. It, I think that your problem is is that you're mirroring something that has you have the both of them have to be probably set to 1080. They are. They're both set to 1080. Yeah. Sure. Um, 
Yeah, you know. that's the weird thing about it. I do it all the time, but where I do find issues is if I mirror something and you and changing the state in and out of mirroring also can sometimes affect the calibration. It, it's you kind of have to calibrate that every single time you put it into a state. So you you change the state into mirroring or into its own piece, and you have to open that calibration or recalibrate it. Um, that's I mean that's what I found needs to happen every single time, which is why I don't change the state at all. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I leave it. So I think if you're changing from mirroring to non mirroring, you probably every time you do that, you need to recalibrate it. Well, so so mirroring. So that's interesting. So um, I've got a, a quadro card on this computer, and mm -hmm. so the tablet is on one output. And I've got three other monitors with uh, uh, the whiteboard drawing program on one of them, uh, full screened. Um, and I'm projecting my video image, and that really doesn't matter because it's just an image. Right. Hmm. I I don't, and I will say that I'm, I have almost no experience with the Quadro card. <laughs> so, so I don't know if, I mean, like for using it that way, I mean, we use it for processing, but I don't use it there, yeah. It's an, it's an interesting problem. Yeah, absolutely. I'll continue um, working yeah, on it. Yeah, absolutely. Next next question. Next question comes from us, to us from Tyler Roberts in Chambersburg. And it's, is there an audio interface that is a USB interface for the computer input and one eighth inch out to a camera for embedded audio on HDMI via the camera? Go ahead, Jeff. I'm not sure I'm reading this right, but I saw this as he wants to take the audio into the interface and have it come out to USB to the computer and eighth inch to the camera. And if that's all you need to do, basically any stereo simple USB interface would work because you can take the headphone output that is eighth inch as a variable gain on it as long as you use the direct monitoring. And so that will give you the just the analog inputs. And that they will go USB to the computer and they will come eighth inch out the headphone. Now, of course, you cannot then get any sound out of this interface from the computer because you're using the headphone output as pure direct monitoring only. I'll go at Javier. Yeah, Jeff is right. Basically, any interface can be used like that. Uh, and we has like extra outputs i've used even like on location like zoom f8ms that are like field recorders or can work as interface as well and you have multiple outputs so you can even route like only some mics to that camera so as long as you're using it just like a scratch track or reference you have no problem because of of course if you have a long run of an eight inch it's gonna degrade very quickly but i have i have, I have done it with hoppers with like in uh, wireless hoppers from uh, the the interface to camera and it works perfectly uh, go ahead, Jeffrey. Uh, I have a lot of uh, uh, IK multimedia devices, and this is the Duo iRig. And the best part about this is you can bring in interfaces through a quarter inch or eighth inch, but you can also do outputs of eighth inch right there to monitors to main. They, they have a two channel, they have a one channel uh, XLR, they have a two channel, and they have a, the quad, which also has XLR outs. So you can uh, hook it up to boards, which I would highly recommend. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, as Jeff and Javier mentioned, almost any uh, USB interface should work if it has a headphone output. Uh, but remember, you have a control, a level control over that headphone output. So uh, if you want to have something that's portable and battery powered, I'd suggest the Zoom F3 is a new one, which is a two input. It has phantom power if you're going to use microphones into it. It's very small, has onboard recording. Plus, it serves as a computer interface, so as a USB interface to any computer, Mac, or PC. Uh, and you can get the uh, line level output over uh, 3.5 millimeter output and plug that into your camera uh, and set your camera to line level input. I'm not sure if it has mic level or line level output, but there are a variety out there of items out there designed to do this. The F3 is nice because it has 32-bit recording built in and it can output 32-bit also over the USB to your computer at the same time to record 32-bit 30 30 floating output. So you don't have to worry about levels that much. Next question. Next question comes to us from Kyle Hammond. Is there a way to share Ecamm profiles with multiple people and or machines so a show can look the same even though it's run from a different source? I don't think that there is. Uh, I don't think that you can share those profiles, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, I think that uh, look for a time when we have Keeley or or Jeff or, or um, David Paskin on. <laughs> they are our in-house Ecamm experts, um, but I don't I don't think that's possible. But I'm not 100% sure. Next question. 
Next question comes from Jeff Francis, Columbia, South Carolina. ATEM Mini ISO recording and opening in Resolve is awesome, but I'd love to be able to flag bad cuts to fix in the re-edit, ideally right in the Resolve project. Any ideas? Go, ahead, Jeff. So we know you can record ISO and it will build a Resolve project for you, but if you're doing a two, three hour show and in the heat of the moment, you realize you want to go back and tweak this particular edit, uh, logging that and finding that uh, is difficult, especially, you know, you can't write that down. Uh, you don't, maybe you don't have an assistant who can log that at that moment. I'd love to have something that would log it right in the Resolve project. I've been thinking about maybe even just keying a transparent image so that I would look for that transparent image in the Resolve project. Um, but I'm wondering if anyone has any brilliant ideas about how to like log directly in the timeline of the Resolve project. Yeah, I don't know how to do it directly. Um, one thing that you may want to look at is, uh, I believe that Lumberjack, which is you know a, a software that Bill and I, I think are familiar with for on-site, um, if you have proper time code, you can be sitting in Lumberjack and type in your notes, and then you'll have time code that it matches up with the time code that's in your edit. It doesn't solve the problem specifically, but you could probably build some kind of, it's designed mostly to work with Final Cut. So it'll come in, those notes will come in as markers in Final Cut. <laughs> you know, so um, you can make that work, but getting those markers to transport into, um, uh, transport into Resolve, I don't know where that would, you know, where that would fit. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, real quickly, there was in Lumberjack, what you can do is use a phone or an eye device of any kind separately. It is tracking real time and it can sync to your project timeline. So anytime you hit a predefined keyword or a button or a highlight or whatever, it will list that in the time code string and you can bring that into Final Cut and find those things exactly. Yeah, go ahead, Courtney, real quick. Yeah, most timecode based recorders, you could feed the audio and jam sync their internal timecode generator to your uh, your run of show timecode at the beginning of the show. And then just record the audio in with timecode. And most of those have a marker button where you can hit the record button again anywhere and it'll drop a cue mark at that point. And then just bring that audio track in and synchronize it to the timecode of your project and resolve. And you'll have your cue marks uh, indicated along that audio track as a separate audio recording. Go, ahead, Jeffrey. Uh, and an alternative is if you get something like a Stream Deck foot pedal and then uh, have a uh, separate time code running that you can just, if you need to uh, mark something that you need to go back to, you just hit the foot switch and then it'll create a, a mark in uh, whatever program you want to use from there. And that will uh, at least they'll give you some sort of idea where to go. We had one producer, uh, I, I'm not recommending this necessarily, but it worked pretty well, that um, would have, they had a headset mic that went into a recorder and and left was them and right was the program audio. And they would just sit there watching, just going, oh, change that, fix that. This isn't going to work. You know, like, and they would literally just say what they wanted in one of the tracks. And then what we would do is we would bring it into the, into Final Cut, put those two tracks in, get rid of the, use the program audio to sync it with the audio that we had. We didn't even have time code. Use the program audio to sync it with the time code. And then you saw their, their, their verbal notes were just sitting there in there and you could, and all you had to do is you just see the peaks because they didn't say anything otherwise. You know, they just, they would open their mic, say what they wanted to say about what was wrong with that edit and close it. And you would just see these little um, audio things going along it. It, it. We didn't use it that often because it took a little bit for us to set up, but it, it worked really well. Like it was really fast to go through and fix the things that they wanted to fix. Um, and they didn't have to write anything down during the show. They said, I can't type fast enough. I just need to be able to say it and then walk away. <laughs> like, you know, and so they were sitting and they weren't sitting in the same room as the event. So they were able to just, and sometimes you, you it wasn't safe for work. <laughs> so, so, so anyway, that was, that was one of the other problems. Okay. We are now changing subjects to our second hour and talking about psychoacoustics. And uh, we're, I'm going to throw it over to Jeff Francis to tell us a little bit about it and, uh, and how we uh, need to think about it for our work. Go ahead, Jeff. So psychoacoustics, what is that? Well, acoustics is how sound interacts with the physical world. So it's the physics of sound bouncing around the world. And psychoacoustics is perception. It's how our ears and our brain allow us to perceive sound. Uh, so let me give a really brief sort of outline of the points that I want to kind of go through so this will uh, spur some questions maybe. 
um, we probably should take a look at the ear and see what our limits are in frequency. That's our sort of x-axis. And we should look at our limits in amplitude, how loud and how soft we can hear. And then if you put the two of those together, we're going to come across things that are called the equal loudness contours that tell us about how we hear different uh, frequencies at different sensitivities. And that also leads into masking, auditory masking, and it leads into our LUFS meter. And then the other thing we should talk about is localization, which is how we as human beings, our ears and our head and our brain allow us to perceive that sound is coming from, oh, over there. You know, you know, you can close your eyes and hear where someone's coming from. And that's all the process of localization. Um, so real quick, there's the ear. Uh, and we have in green the the outer ear and in red the inner ear and in purple the oh, sorry in red the middle ear and in purple the inner ear and that little curly snail shell is the thing called the cochlea and that's where sound waves pressure waves get turned into nerve pulses that go to the brain um, one of the really cool things is the middle ear where your eardrum your tympanic membrane connects into the cochlea through three of the tiniest bones in your body. And this is actually there to uh, make a, an impedance match between sound waves in the air and a gas and sound waves in the liquid that's inside your cochlea. So it's going making an impedance match there. It also will uh, amplify sound there about 20 times because you have a larger eardrum. It's a tiny eardrum, but the oval window is even smaller. And then uh, the muscles on those bones can actually contract a little bit when you are in the presence of loud sounds. So it's a little bit like a dynamic compressor right inside your ear. And then if we take that little snail shell of the cochlea and we spread it out, there are transverse waves that go down through that cochlea. And there are all these tiny little hairs, hair cells that are attached to nerves. There's about 4,000 primary what they call the inner hair cells there's a line of those and then there's another 16 uh, 12,000 helper hair cells um, but what's interesting is that as an audio person I think all the time about sound waves as amplitude versus time sound in the air is pressure versus time sound in a coming out of a microphone is electricity versus time sound in a workstation is you know amplitude of bits digital versus time but when you get into the ear, it's actually a frequency sensing mechanism. And closest to the oval window is high frequencies, and low frequencies are all the way at the other end, which is why when you have hearing damage, the first thing that you lose is high frequencies, because those high frequencies, uh, hair receptors are right there at the front. And what's also interesting is that this is not a continuous process the way we might think about it, because nerves... Uh, that send messages to the brain, they discharge every once in a while. So in the presence of constant sound, there's not a constant nerve impulse. It happens every once in a while. So our ear is kind of this frequency analyzer. Um, so what frequencies can we hear? Well, everyone would say the sort of standard is um, 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. I'm going to play a, a sine sweep now that goes all through that. Now we're going across zoom and youtube and who knows if you're going to have the extremes of this but uh and we did test the level so it shouldn't be too bad um, but this is just a sweep from low to high and here yeah i didn't hear it. yeah somehow that's not being fed out. through Jeff, is that, sorry is that fed into um computer the screen sharing computer sound uh it's just right into the h hdmi of the atem yeah i think that i think that the um well we didn't hear anything at all so i'm not sure whether that was um the noise cancellation in zoom or whether something oh i hear it now there it is yeah let's do it again but with sound yeah thank you mickey it's the uh original sound okay great let's try that again And was that full Seeing 20 to 20? That. That's a full 20 to 20. 
now who knows what Zoom is doing to that and limiting what we're hearing, um, but y'all can Heard find it. it. Yeah. Yeah. Y'all can find an oscillator and you probably noticed that not all of those uh, frequencies were the same auditory level to you. Um, and we're going to get into that in a little bit, but um, so we hear pitch, um, not frequency. And when you see displays of frequency, it's always done logarithmically because we hear in ratios, not in perfect numbers. So a doubling of frequency is an octave. Um, and so when we hear musical tones, if we can hear a pitch, then it's somewhat periodic, at least over a short term. So if we hear a middle C, it's periodic over a short term while that note is playing. And anything periodic is made up of the overtone series, which is the fundamental frequency, and then any integer multiple of that. So one time is the, the fundamental, fundamental frequency. How do you define fundamental frequency? Well, if it's, it's whatever the lowest frequency, it's the rate of repeat. That's how often that is coming. So middle C repeats 261 times a second. A440 repeats 440 times a second. If you hear a pure sine tone of 250 hertz, that's just 250 hertz. But if you're a complex wave, something that's playing 250 hertz, an oboe, a person singing, that has other frequencies in it, and that's the overtone series. Got it. Um, so that's what gives uh, instruments their, their tone color. Um, it makes everything different even though they're playing the same note right. uh, for us musical people. Um, there's what we would look at for the overtone series. So you can see that we start with a, a C and the next thing up is an octave above that. Any doubling is an octave. Four times would be another octave. Eight times would be another octave. 16 times would be another octave. Um, so I'm going to play this based on 250 and it's just going to step through the overtone series. I'm going to do that again where you can look at the musical notes. So building those up together, and an organ does this, by having different pipes and each pipe plays a particular overtone and the stops of the organ allow you to bring in different overtones to make different timbres. Um, but this is all the, the frequency side of things. And you probably again noticed as I played through those that certain of them were louder than others, even though I'm creating all these tones at exactly the same level, your perception of them is slightly different. So then we get into how loud things are. When sound gets out in the air, um, we need a way kind of to express how much pressure change we perceive. Um, and dealing with pressure numbers, uh, pounds per square inch, steins per square centimeter, you know, the things you put in your tire, or what we do in sound is pascals, all of those are kind of a, uh, tough to work with. So we turn everything into decibels, and the technical thing would be decibels SPL, sound pressure level. And this is all about our amplitude of how loud and how soft we can hear. There are sounds softer, softer than the softest thing we can hear. We just can't hear them. Just like there are frequencies beyond what we can hear, that they repeat faster than we can hear or slower than what we can hear. So generally, the, the zero point of the dB SPL scale is set to be the threshold of hearing, the, the quietest thing we can hear. And then we can get things up to, generally we say about 120 dB SPL is the threshold of sensation and 140 dB SPL is the threshold of pain. Um, again, it kind of depends on what frequency and what frequency that is, and we're heading towards that. Um, so there's a general just kind of like chart of some different things, you know, uh, conversational speech around 70 dB SPL. Um, hearing loss and um, hearing protection, 
Uh, starts at about 85 dBSPL is where um, OSHA and I can't remember the other organization start to do this, uh, that they regulate if you're going to be in that noise environment for eight hour workday, that your employer has to provide you with hearing protection. And the duration that you can withstand that goes down as the noise level goes up. Um, one of the organizations does every 6 dB, and 6 dB is a doubling of amplitude. Uh, the other organization does 3 dB, which is a doubling of power. 6 dB would be four times the power. Um, but basically, if you think about if every time we go up by 3 dB, using the more conservative one, I have to cut my time in half. I start at 85 for eight hours. I go to 88 for four hours. I go to 91 for two hours. I go to 94 for one hour. I go to 97 for 30 minutes. I go 100 dBSPL for 15 minutes. Your average rock concert may be 110 to 115 dBSPL. NASCAR race is going to be even higher than that. So hearing damage can occur very, very quickly. And is that is that hearing damage permanent? Is there any way to recover it once it's been damaged? Uh, I am not an audiologist. I am not a doctor. So I don't know the answer to <laughs> all of curious. that. Um, well, and, should and have again, started with that caveat, but... Yeah, and, and, and I think that's interesting because you look at like airplanes and some airplanes are, you know, ranging from, you know, the seven, 70 range all the way up into the low 85, you know, 85, 86, you know, D, you know uh, at, at DB and, and that starts to get pretty close. And that's what a lot of pilots have problems over time in very specific ranges, right? This is where you're talking about where your brain is not able to kind of manage the, or you're not able to hear a lot of those things that would normally be in a normal range because you've just been hearing it for so many hours, um, you know, I mean, thousands of hours, right? Right. And that damage will occur there. So if we take this frequency range that we can hear and this level range that we can hear and kind of use both of them, um, we get to what are called the equal loudness contours. So these were experiments that were begun uh, back in the 1930s uh, by Fletcher Munson, these two two gentlemen that did these studies later in the 50s uh, by two guys named Robinson Dadson. So you'll hear them referred to as the Fletcher Munson curves. And so what they did basically was sit people down in a calibrated room and give them either speakers or headphones and they would play a tone at a known pressure. And then they would play another tone and give them a volume control and ask them to make that to be the same perceived volume. And so as we heard, low frequencies are hard for us to hear. We need to have lots and lots of pressure in order for low frequencies to be heard. But things kind of in the three kilohertz to five kilohertz, that ambulance uh, siren, the baby crying, that annoying range, our ears are very sensitive to. So they, they came up with these charts and you kind of need to take a look at them for a moment. But the pink line down at the bottom that says TOH, so that's the threshold of hearing. So on the Bottom of the chart, the x-axis, we have frequency. And on the left side, we have pure, absolute, objective, measured pressure change. And what this line shows us is that subjectively, our perception is we can't hear anything below that pink line in the absence of all other sound. So whereas at 3, 4 kilohertz, we can hear this very tiny pressure change down at 20 micropascals, that zero dB SPL. It needs to be 40 or 50 dB louder if it's going to be down at 30 hertz. And so our hearing is not flat. And that's accepted. We all, it's pretty averaged across the human, human and population. It's, pretty, it's evolutionary. We, we can hear a lot where we need to, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and that's all in, you know, physiologically, the design of our of our uh, ear canal. It's the amplification of those bones is not flat across frequency. It's the way the cochlea is laid out. All of that is designed for this. Um, and it's interesting to note, if you look at the shape of those curves, as it gets louder, the shape changes. So our hearing relative lows versus mids versus highs changes as sound gets louder. This is why everybody likes things loud, because we can hear lows more easily when everything is louder. And if you remember back on old receivers, AV receivers, there was often a loudness compensation switch or a loudness button. And what that did is when your volume level was low, it would increase, it would add in bass because you couldn't perceive bass when sound was quiet. So 
this is the problem that people get into when they tend to mix audio really loud. If they're monitoring very loud, they don't turn up the bass appropriate because their ears are working better for low frequencies at that point. And then when they go back and listen quietly, it seems anemic, like it's missing low frequencies. Um, from those curves, when we had sound pressure level meters, we wanted to uh, make them read not pure pressure, but we wanted to read something that was more like perception. And so they get weighting curves. That's where you see the A curve and the C weighting curve of sound pressure level meters. And what that eventually became was our LUFS meter. So a LUFS meter compensates for level and human perception. So a low frequency tone will not make the LUFS meter move very much, whereas a high frequency tone will. Um, and if I just play you two tones here, this is a, a 204 kilohertz. Uh, you'll hear pretty easily the difference in your perception. The, both of these should be in the range where zoom doesn't mess up with it too much. Most speakers and headphones can do 204 kilohertz fairly easily, but you'll find that these two... Those two tones should be perceived fairly differently. And I'm going to do it again because I want to see what the LUFS meter shows us on these two tones. And you see the LUFS meter shows us about a 6 dB difference. So the LUFS meter is taking in audio and not just pushing a meter up and down, but it's actually analyzing the audio and changing its weighting based on average human listening curves, these equal loudness contours. And that's where we've gotten to with the, uh, the LUFS meter appreciating that so much, because uh, it does give us something that reads like people listen. Good point to stop and, and ask for questions or... Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, Bill. So I was interested when you were showing the overtone series chart, um, I expected it to double and go up, but at the top in the treble range up there or in the, the treble clef, I started seeing sharps and flats. W wouldn't a mathematical doubling stay on the bass frequency? Well, the f remember that this is integer multiple, so it's not just double. If we just double, we'll get a C, ah. and, and I use 250 because it's fairly close to middle C. It's not exactly middle C, but let's call it C. You would get, if you double, you go from 250 to 500 to 1,000, but we're doing integer multiple. So you go from 250 to 500 to 750 to 1,000, and it's that third partial that is the, the musically is the fifth. It's a G. And then as you go higher and higher up, you begin to get all these other notes in there. Thanks. Go ahead, Jeff. One thing I, I love, I don't know if we can or, or want to put the, if we could put the meter up uh, next to you doing that test again, I would love to hear that. I think it's really meaningful for, for folks to see what a difference that is because it's, it's, it's really amazing. The other thing I'll say is, um, oh, by the way, I guess I'm glad to know that, you know, I must still have some pretty good hearing because, you know, some of those high notes were, uh, were uncomfortable. I had to turn the volume down. Uh, and I did want to mention with hearing loss or hearing damage, uh, like Alex was asking about, um, is to point out that, you know, even if there's not immediate permanent damage, it definitely is a cumulative effect problem. So um, whatever damage you may be incurring that you don't notice any uh, effects in the short term will absolutely have a long-term cumulative effect uh, that you want to try and avoid. Next question. Next question comes to us from Douglas Carmichael, and he says, do broadcasters use any specific psychoacoustic tricks in their audio processing to make their product sound more appealing? Jeff, anything that's specific there? Well, that that three to four to five K range is is a tough is a tough range because it's the place you go to when you want something to to cut through because you know people's ears are sensitive but it's also the place where things become harsh and annoying immediately or very quickly. So uh, that's a thing that um, is very tough. I know that uh, if we look back at early days of 
digital and we're trying to get the best we could out of 16-bit CD, one of the things that people would do from their 24-bit masters is dither, which is a good thing to do. But then they began to do dither that was what's called noise-shaped. Um, and that would take, so dither is just noise that is basically randomizing the process of going from 24 bits down to 16. We've got, we've, we want to round like we did when we were in, you know, third grade, we round, you know, five and up goes up and zero to four goes down. We're rounding, but we're going to add some randomization to that rounding. So it doesn't always round the same direction. So we add in a little bit of randomness and that's noise. Well, just adding regular full range pink noise will do that job. But if we can take that noise and put it in places where people don't hear it as well, then we can actually make the perceptible dynamic range of the digital audio closer to that 24 bits, even though we only have 16. So it was definitely, you know, those kind of tricks. And then when we get into, we'll get into later on a little bit about masking and how masking is absolutely used as a psychoacoustic trick in MP3 and MP4. Go ahead, Courtney. Uh, yeah, there used to be this thing in, in motion picture recording uh, called the Academy Filter. And they used to have to use that because of the response of optical soundtracks. You can hear the, <laughs> maybe you can hear the uh, leaf blower outside. Uh, was such that uh, dialogue was harder to hear because on the optical soundtrack because it couldn't reproduce uh, the full frequency range. And they used to, uh, when mixing on... Uh, on magnetic, they used to apply the academy filter so that the mixer could hear how it's going to sound on the optical output. So they would apply that filter, and that filter would be applied to the uh, recorder on the output. That's why people say, well, how come I can hear the dialogue on those old 1940s movies a lot better than I can hear uh, from this one that's in Dolby Atmos? And the dialogue gets buried uh, in all the frequency. That's because the frequency response of optical back then didn't cover the full frequency bandwidth of the human hearing. And they emphasized the uh, areas of, um, of the bandwidth that the human voice was in. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that uh, broadcasters do now is they encode Dolby uh, Atmos or these positional stereo images, and they psychoacoustically treat them so that it, it reproduces imaging in the user without of just two speakers. You can hear something it sounds like it's coming from behind you or above you or beside you by applying a limited frequency response and time delay between the left and the right channel to psychoacoustically fool your brain into thinking it's coming from somewhere other than that speaker that's directly in front of you. So that's done commonly in, in any of the any of the sound bars that you have that only have two or three speakers right. in front of you. And, and, and uh, Jeff, are you addressing time time of flight uh, at all? In, in I don't know if you have more slides. I don't know if you're localization. That. Yeah. 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 We'll, we'll get so. to that. Yeah, absolutely. Marty. So, yes. So um, as Courtney mentioned, um, every broadcast medium, every recording medium, or at least analog recording mediums had, a, had its own frequency response limitations. Um, and so over the air FM, over the air AM, over the air television, recording tape, analog recording tape, all had their own frequency response curves, which needed to be compensated for. And um, so when calibrating, for example, a, a, an analog tape recorder, uh, we would apply a certain curve to the input frequency response and the output frequency response that would compensate for the tape. So in broadcast television, broadcast radio, they do similar things to um, either first flatten out the frequency response and then apply certain emphasis to certain parts of the frequency bands, depending on the kind of program material, whether it's speech for talk radio or for music. But then <clears throat> there's also the thing about perceived level versus measured level, and that has a lot to do with dynamics. If you compress the signal, uh, to a certain degree, it will sound louder, even though it won't measure any louder than the legal limits set by the FCC. There are, um, and, and then delays and uh, echo and reverberation can all psychoacoustically uh, make an, a different impression on the brain and the ears than if it were just dry. Good, Bill. 
Yeah, that's the, that hard compressed sound to make every station that you would punch back in the old days of radio. You wanted whatever the signal was they were going to hear, and that's why radio stations used to put a lot of compression and a lot of things on there. The other thing we used to do, it, it, there was a period, the FCC kind of clamped down on it after a short period of time, of doing your master and then reversing the tape and run it through a compressor so the leading slope would hit and fool the transmitter <laughs> signal processing into not seeing that big spike coming in. And that would make it sound a little louder. Those things we did for a little while in radio. And then everybody just, they clamped down on everybody. And they said that you have to stay within much tighter limits. But those were some of the fun things in the early days. Go ahead, Javier. Uh, definitely. I think that everyone that's working with audio is in, in some way working with acoustics and have to take into account like for example uh, uh when you're designing a speaker the the fact that it's enhances some frequencies or like uh, tames other frequencies with the same with microphones when you're doing sound design you are taking into account psychoacoustics because you have to uh, make an emotional response of the audio decisions you take so like even like for now that we have like this loudness specs where all the all the content has the same levels makes a different psychoacoustic impact than before when we have like uh commercials a very high level and the programs went very low level so all of those decisions uh even like level decisions i think are psychoacoustic decisions that broadcasters mixers and everyone has to take into an account go ahead tom and in the 70s the chief engineer put in a smile curve on the graphic equalizer and he boosted up the low end and then he took it on up to the high end and the mediums were down. Go ahead, uh, Jeff. You wanna keep, do you have anything else you want to show there before we jump to more questions or you want to take more questions? Um, so showing that the uh, two tones with a, uh, with a Luffs meter. So this is the, uh, the Insight Luffs meter and the number we're primarily looking for, LUFS gives us three, an integrated over all time, a short term, and a momentary, and momentary is kind of useless, but uh, if we look at that short term, you'll see that the low tone is reads much lower. So there's that perception, perception of the two tones we hear it as two different levels and the Luffs meter shows us those as two different levels. Even though if we just look at a standard uh, decibel meter in, in DBFS, they are exactly minus 20, well, minus 23 because of their pan center. Um, so another stage of, of psychoacoustics we should think about is localization. So this is about, this is not panning. This is not spatialization, but these lead into that. This is about one real sound source in the physical world and your head and your ears, your two ears and your brain and how you localize where that is. So the primary things that go into this are uh, time of arrival, interoral time of arrival. Sometimes this is called uh, ITD, interoral time difference. But it's very simple. When sound is off to the side of your head, it gets to one ear sooner than the other one. How and much that's the time primary, difference? That's the primary way. We think that it's it's soft, you know, it, it's we're hearing it less or more, but the primary way we're doing it is timing, right? I mean, that's the, is, is how we're making a decision about where that is, at least in, in the plane that goes around us. There's, there's two primary cues and that's the primary one at low frequencies. And then the other primary cue is something called head shadowing, which is basically your head makes an acoustic shadow. So if sound moves off to the side, one ear gets it full range, unchanged, and the other side gets it shadowed. And since your head has a physical size, and so do wavelengths in the air, and now we need to think about uh, different wavelengths. So sound has like 10 octaves. So we have a huge range from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz of the wavelength of sound. So the lowest thing we can perceive around 20 cycles per second, 20 hertz, is 56 feet long. Okay, this is the, if you imagine a 18-wheeler tractor trailer, those are 53 feet long. So that's how long a low-frequency sound wave is. And then if you go all the way up to, uh, you know, normal mid-range things, those are, those are about the size of a sheet of paper. And then you go up to 20 kilohertz, and now we're down to five-eighths of an inch. If you don't know what five eighths of an inch is, it's the threads on a mic stand. 
So there's, there's the range of sizes of sound waves once they get out in the air. And so how big is your head compared to a 20 hertz wave? Your head's tiny. So those low frequencies will, will refract right around your head. Uh, sorry, diffract. Uh, refraction is something different. They will go right around your head. And everyone's used to this. You, you can hear sound around corners and you tend to hear low frequencies more. Low frequencies go everywhere. They're hard to control. So head shadowing works really well at high frequencies. And because you're not getting high frequencies to the other ear, it's harder to perceive time of arrival difference. So high time of arrival primarily works at low frequencies. So you have those two cues, the time difference and the uh, head shadowing. And those work really well in the horizontal plane because your ears are on the side of your head. So how do we hear vertically? Um, the primary thing that goes into this is something that's called uh, pinna cues, and the pinna or the oracle is the fleshy part on the outside of your head. That's the thing that most of us call an ear. But the pinna has some bumps in it, and those bumps will reflect sound, and they will create a unique comb filtering. And so depending on where the sound is coming from, vertically and horizontally, you will get a different amount of comb filtering. And each person is a little bit different, but you're, you train this mechanism as you grow up. And so this is not perceived as a change in timbre or tone color or sound quality. Your brain pulls this information out as localization information. Your brain doesn't say, oh, that's a funny sounding trumpet. It's got this weird comb filtering on it. Your brain says that trumpet is to my right, 30 degrees, and it's 15 degrees up. So, so you all have of to those add, so are, when you add as you add that filter, that's how you get the brain to think that it's getting it's um, getting something from a from a different vertical. Right? Or can you? Yeah. So so if if we take all of these ideas and we take a piece of audio and we want to feed it into the ear canal, so hopefully the person the the listener is wearing earbuds. Um, and so we've removed their head and we've removed their pinna from having any effect. We can manipulate one sound into two ear signals, one to the left ear, one to the right ear. And we can vary the time difference between them. We and can one vary thing, the head shadowing. And one thing that, that I notice is like if you're doing any kind of um, audio delay. So a lot of times we're setting up an audio delay for, you know, syncing video and you start turning the left channel to delay it. Suddenly it sounds really wide. You know, like you, you suddenly have this imp impression because it's suddenly one ear is getting it a lot slower than the other one, right? Yeah. So you're faking your brain that you now think there's, your brain thinks the sound is moved because it's getting right. to one ear earlier than the other. And your brain uses that information for localization. So if we take all of those things from one audio signal and a position we can create two ear signals. So if say I have a sound, and this is done in video games all the time, there's, there's an explosion off to my right 45 degrees and it's 20 degrees up. Well, my right ear signal will be early and it will be full range and it would have the pin cues, the comb filtering high frequency effects that would say that this is 20 degrees up. And then the left ear would be slightly later and it would be slightly dulled because of the head shadowing that's going on there. And this all gets clumped into the term of a head related transfer function or an HRTF. And this same idea is what's used by um, AirPod Pros to play back spatial audio. So there is a 5.1.4 signal that is sent to the AirPods and they create and they map this ceiling speaker into the two AirPods as to make me hear that that's where that signal is. That's great. Um, uh, let's go to more questions. Next question. David Brady in New York City is up next again. In this case, he says, in the 2002 film Irreversible, the first 60 minutes had an extremely low 27 hertz frequency running in the background. This caused a state of discomfort in some. Is sense around a form of psychoacoustics? Marty? Well, I'm not sure about sense around in particular, which is a, uh, a 
you know, there might be uh, specifications for what sense around or a definition for what sense around really is. But the effect that they were going for definitely is a state of discomfort. Um, another film is uh, The Sound of Metal, which came out just a couple of years ago about a, um, a drummer in a hard rock band and how he experienced his gradual hearing loss. And filmmakers did a really good job of uh, trying to give normal people who people who have normal hearing watching the film that sense of what he was going through right. uh, during that. And you know, audio conservation is something that very, very few people in, in general population uh, take into account or even think about. Right. Um, you know, we'll go to concerts and we'll go to loud concerts and we come out of the concert and we can sense that our hearing has been dulled because we've been in this really high volume environment for a while. And then we'll go to bed and in the morning, it appears that our hearing has returned to normal. So there's a recovery thing there. Mm -hmm. However, hearing loss is gradual and progressive. And if we are constantly uh, ex um, exposed to that high level kind of noise, whether it's in the workplace or sound engineers who do who work at clubs and concerts every single night, um, that's going to add up. And, and over 10, 20, 30 years of doing this, you will find that when you go to get your hearing tested that you will have losses in certain parts of your hearing range that you may not even be aware of. Um, so paying attention to conserving your hearing, wearing earplugs when, uh, when it's appropriate. Yep. And there are some earplugs that do a really good job of just quieting right. down this, mm -hmm. the, uh, the level without changing the frequency response yeah, and uh, is really important to do. I'm going to veer us back. Uh, you know, we'll talk about how we perceive audio. We probably have a whole other second hour on on hearing loss, <laughs> which most of us have, have, have had some of. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, Sense Around was developed for uh, by Universal Studios for the movie Earthquake to simulate the feeling that you get in an earthquake. And to do that, they generated uh, pink noise, pseudo-random uh, noise in the theater, uh, triggered by cues on the on the film to right. uh, deliver 40 to 120 Hertz. And it gave you uh, more of a sense. You didn't hear it necessarily, but you'd feel it in your chest and it, and it created an anxiety in the audience. And that's what they decided. for. Hey, go ahead, Jeff. If you're interested in uh, media about low frequency tones, there's an interesting myth busters episode about the Brown note, which is in, they did nine Hertz and uh, got uh, Meyer to bring a whole ring of, of, in, infrasound subwoofers to create this low frequency effect. Uh, pretty impressive to was see the, the camera shaking. Oh, it yeah. was not. It's not effective, right? I mean, I and and I do, I will say. I mean, I think we're getting into this, but when we talk about how you shape that, um, I've been in movies where there's a lot of little noises that go behind you that are very low and muffled, and they just create a sense of paranoia, and it's you know designed around that. Um, it's probably a whole other second hour as well. Next question. Jeff Cohen in Miami Beach, Florida is up next. Is there a meaningful difference in our perception when listening to audio in over-the-ear headphones versus custom in-ear monitors that go into the ear canal? Hey, go ahead, uh, Jeff. I mean, it's primarily that pin effect. Mm -hmm. The fact that if it's over your ear, you will get some of those comb filtering happening there. Right, now, so it's, kind of, it's an usually, additive thing. Yeah. And does the, do you know if the over ear, like if you're using the AirPod Maxes, do, do they take that into account that, oh, this is over the ear, so I'm not going to do the same thing when it comes to spatialization as an AirPod might do? Do you, do you know if that's the case? I don't know if that's the case because I don't think they have different drivers that are in right. different locations of that. Next question. Claluc Lopez Waterman in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. When I first learned about psychoacoustics, it was surrounding us speakers in a venue with live music or singing and adding delay to move where we perceive the audio is coming from. How do you train the brain and ear to calibrate this? Good, Javier. 
Uh, Jeff uh, touched a bit about this you know, earlier. It's um, taking into account uh, something that's called the Hass effect or the presence effect. Uh, it happens when we have a sound coming from two different paces and the same signal, but it's coming within 40 milliseconds of it. You, we perceive it as one one signal and it starts getting, uh, as long as the, the delay gets longer, you start perceiving it like clearly from one place and clearly for another. Uh, the best way to train this, at least for me, is to do it uh, in less of using with like pure tones, like like. 20 hertz or 2000 hertz or whatever try to use it with something that we are very used to like the human voice so if you put a human voice like duplicate the signal and try what happens with five milliseconds 10 milliseconds 20 milliseconds you'll first start uh, to lessen this um, effect when it moves to a place and you it, it seems bigger it's flicked like fuller so it helps a lot when sound design even like for concerts you're in a rock concert you cannot pan something to the right because people on the left will not be able to hear it so you have to you can pan it with delays you can like someone in the center is going to feel it on the right but people in the right is going to hear it and people in the left are going to hear it so the best way i found to to learn how to use it is try to play with different signals like guitar tones our voices and all of that and and try different different uh amounts of delay and what it does to it go ahead, jeff yeah so precedence effect is that we localize sound to where we get the first sound from it, it the nickname for this and, and the person who came up with this called it the law of the first wavefront whichever wavefront arrives to you first that's where we localize to so if you can imagine you're sitting in a typical lecture hall and there's a speaker on the center of the stage and you're off to the left closer to the left loudspeaker and those two are coming at the same time the path length from the speaker is less so you will perceive his sound is coming from the speaker if we add a delay to the loudspeakers to move that sound behind the acoustic sound from the speaker, then we can perceive them coming from the center of the stage where they're standing. And this is done all the time with, with under balcony delays. You know, if we put speakers under a balcony, we want to delay them to be so that we don't hear them first. Um, and then the Haas effect is tied in with that. The Haas effect is basically the later sound can actually be louder than the earlier sound, and we still perceive the earlier sound as where it's coming from, within reason. And and this is also where you can, if you look at like companies like Alacoustic and Meyer, they both have very very complex arrays that can potentially you know more localize the experience of what what the positioning is. Um, you know, I've been in a theater with 180 speakers, and it's got a lot of resolution, and it also has a lot of where you sit ma matters less um, because there's so many places to to put it. Um, yeah. uh, next question. Eric Billings in Washington, D.C. Are the types of psychoacoustics being applied to media changing due to generational types of hearing damage? And uh, Eric notes ear pods versus concerts versus clubs. Or are the changes simply incorporating modern delivery technology? All right, go ahead, Marty. Yeah, delivery technology has a lot to do with it. Um, and each of the different devices that we'll use every day, whether it be, you know, desktop audio system, home theater system, uh, your phone, uh, your ear, AirPods, uh, they will all have this, you know, some sort of uh, customizing technology built into them to take advantage uh, of their, you know, their attributes. Um, I can say that uh, uh, when you're going to a major concert, uh, the engineers there, the sound designers, the system designers, they are absolutely uh, utilizing uh, psychoacoustics and taking into account the acoustics of, of the room, and every room is different as they go from city to city. Um, some bands, uh, you know, Pink Floyd and others, uh, they will have surround speakers uh, set up all over the place and uh, take care of and, and, and incorporate that into their sound. When it comes to clubs, local clubs, um, I don't think they pay as much attention to that. And the engineers uh, aren't quite at the, you know, many of them aren't quite at that level where they even have the equipment to take care of that in, uh, in, in many local clubs. <clears throat> yeah, go ahead, Jeff. I definitely think that the prevalence of uh, AirPods or any kind of ear in ear listening, you know, 
20, 30 years ago, more people listened on loudspeakers, and now a majority of people listen on headphones. And so that has brought back the ability to do binaural and to do the spatial audio much easier to use this head-related transfer function. Um, the other thing that I see in psychoacoustics in media is, is auditory masking. Um, and um, so if I'll take a little side here and just explain what auditory yeah. masking is, if we go back to um, the idea of the Fletcher Munson curves. So we have that pink line that is our threshold of hearing. So if there is a pressure at a frequency that is below that line, you and I cannot hear it. And then that perception, our auditory perception, actually changes based on the presence of other sounds. So basically, if there's a loud sound at some frequency, we can't hear a quieter sound that's close to it in frequency. And so the way I think of this is like you imagine that there's a, a tent pole, like a circus tent, and you push the tent pole up, that's the loud sound, that's the masker, and it pushes up our minimum audible threshold. And so we can't hear other stuff that's close to it. And this happens both in frequency and in time. Uh, where's my time picture? So here you see uh, amplitude versus time of a waveform. And so there's a loud sound, say someone hits a snare drum, you can't hear sounds immediately after that, can't perceive them. And even actually because of the way our ear works, there could be a sound, a quiet sound in the clear ahead of that one that you can't perceive because the loud sound exists there. Now, when we think about that, when we think about a lot of things, one of the things I notice when I'm listening to something that's mixed spatially is I feel like I hear more things, you know, like, like that, that, and I don't know if that's actually the case or not, but I feel like I can hear more definition in, I can hear thing, hear instruments that I couldn't hear before um, because my brain is, perceiving them as, some, you know, rather than just left, right, it's perceiving them in, in a lot of different locations. Does that make any difference in those, in those, uh, in that masking? Uh, I believe it does. Yes. Yeah. That, that the localization allows, it helps you to, to hear those kind of things. Yeah. So all of our data compressors, uh, MP3, MP4, AAC, all those audio data compressors totally use masking to figure out where to hide the quantization noise because mm -hmm. they're resampling the audio with not as many bits. And so not as many bits means higher distortion, more uh, quantization noise, all those kind of things. So they are constantly analyzing the audio versus a model of human hearing. Right. They're determining right now this masking is going on. So there's a loud sound here at two kilohertz. You can't hear this sound at 1500 hertz. So I can hide a lot of noise right there at 1500 hertz. So that two kilohertz signal is going to get encoded with fewer bits. It's actually lower resolution because you don't need it to be because you can't perceive the distortion and noise that's there. So this is, you know, all these data compressors totally use masking. Um, interestingly enough, the amount of masking that occurs in your hearing generally decreases with age. We have critical bands where masking occurs, and generally, uh, as you age, those uh, critical bands get narrower. So us old guys, we can perceive the problems in AAC better than young people can. We can hear the artifacts of that. That's interesting. Uh, next question. Rob Collins in Kansas City, Missouri, up next. And he says, I heard a fire alarm once that while I was looking at the alarm, I was unable to hear where the alarm tone was coming from. What psychoacoustics was probably happening such that I couldn't locate where the sound was coming from? Go ahead, Javier. Uh, alarm sounds, because of their tonal content, are, are great for cutting through everything. It's very easy to listen over if you're, you're listening to a movie or you're in traffic and you hear a, like an ambulance or a, a police car. It's, it, it's really easy to, to listen for it, but because of the ton tonal content, uh, the same thing I was speaking earlier about pure tones. An alarm is not a pure tone, where it's very close to it. It has like very like distinct noises and that they bounce around everything. So it's very hard to place it. That's why... And 
especially if it's moving. And that's why uh, electric cars and hybrid cars, when they're not using the gas motor, they has this synthetic noise that is cl that's not like a pure tone. It's not like the beep of a, like a reverse because that's very hard to place. It's like a different noise. And there's actually a Mythbusters episode where they play someone in the middle and around they put speakers and they blindfold and, and they threw uh, like dodgeballs, I think, at them. Uh, and if they use like pure tones, it almost every time yeah, he hits him because he can protect uh, when, when you use like white noise or other synthetic sounds that are easier to locate you, it's like almost every time you catch it so uh, that's why we use all those synthetic sounds because like alarms and like those kind of uh, like the single noises are very hard to place for our ears go ahead uh, Courtney yeah Jeff touched on it earlier is the time of you hear it and locate it based on the first uh, sound that hits your ear from a certain direction. And the, the high frequency constant tones that are coming out of that are a lot of times are hidden behind a baffle and the baffle will uh, throw the sound out directly and it'll bounce off a window, let's say something on the other side of the room, but it'll be coming indirectly to your ear from the unit itself. So you'll hear it coming bounced off the window first and it'll tend to make you believe, oh, it's coming from over there. And you walk over there, and then it's bouncing off something over on the right side. So you go over the right side, and as you move directions, your brain's confused as to where it's coming from because that baffle is throwing out the sound in different directions, and it's bouncing. The high frequencies bounce a lot better off of smooth surfaces, so you can't really locate it where it is. Next question. Next one comes from Jeff Cohen in Miami Beach, Florida. Can you briefly talk about the legendary Dan Dugan auto mix system? I noticed uh, what was hardware is now supposedly recreated in third-party DSPs and plugins, and he wonders what makes it so special. It's probably not really a psychoacoustic uh, um, a thing, but it is a is an audio processing. What what Dan's algorithms do is is very intelligently instead of gating other mics and so on and so forth, it intelligently pushes them down. So it just manages their levels. So if you pass all the signals into it, it's going to go. This is the most uh, prominent one. I'm just going to push everybody down to maintain a, an even level, but to push the other mics back. And so it helps clarify the dis distance between the mic volumes um, so that you get a lot less, um, you know, phase issues as well as just just a lot less junk going into it. Um, and it makes, it's night and day. But it's not really a psychoacoustic question, but it is a very powerful one. And we're going to get Dan on to talk about it a little bit. Um, but uh, he's, uh, it's, it changed a, a lot of things for a lot of people. There's a lot of auto mix that uh, a lot of auto mixes that are out there that work very similarly, given that the, the patents run out. <laughs> so, so the um, but but I think that a lot of times people look at the gold standard as something that Dan puts his name on, um, or w is willing to allow his name to be put on, um, is usually the gold standard for auto mixing. Uh, next question. Douglas Carmichael back again with, I've fallen in love with the Waves NX range of plugins, more specifically their Germano Studies plugin to make long headphone sessions a lot more tolerable. How do they work? And he's got a link there to the Germano Studios. Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. The biggest difference between headphone monitoring and loudspeaker monitoring is in headphones, the left ear here is the left headphone and the right ear here is the red head, right headphone. In loudspeaker listening, both of your ears hear both speakers. And so your left ear hears the left speaker first, and then the right speaker slightly behind that and shadowed. And so there's all kinds of crosstalk that happens in loudspeakers. And so one of the things that these headphone systems do is give you that crosstalk, but based on a better room. So they're also giving you reflections of the room. Interesting. Go ahead, Marty. Yeah, in addition to that, um, they also sample the um, the original rooms using uh, impulse response sampling. So they, they are actually uh, modeling the acoustics of the room in software and then applying that to the plugins to give you uh, a sense of what that room, the acoustics of that room actually sounds like. Uh, and applying that to your headphones or in your monitors or even your your monitor speakers. Uh, last question for the hour. Last question comes to us from Tony Mobley in Noonan, Georgia. And Tony says, is Jeff Francis using Apple AirPod Pros to monitor audio only or is there something we don't see? Go ahead, Jeff. For this, just uh, just a single AirPod Pro, just to hear people talking. 
Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and what do you use when you're, what, what headphones do you use? Does it, do you find in this, in this environment, what's important to, to manage there? I like, uh, headphones? if I have a Sennheiser HD 650 open backed headphones, if I'm in a quiet environment, if I'm in, uh, someplace noisy, the gold standard of the Sony, uh, V6 or 7506, cause we can't get V6s anymore. Uh, I just know it cause I've been using it for years. And then usually Genelec loudspeakers. Awesome. Very good. Thanks, Jeff. And thanks to everyone else who, uh, who, who threw their, their two cents into the second hour. Great second hour. You know, I, I think that these, you know, really digging into these basics because we're going to bring some folks on. They're going to talk more about, um, you know, whether it's Atmos or, or other types of mixing. We want to, but understanding these basics is going to make it a lot easier for us to kind of follow along and, and really um, bring those conversations forward. So I really appreciate it. Um, also, just a reminder for as far as the medical impact of, of sound, we're going to, in a couple of weeks, we'll be talking about that. We'll bring a medical professional in to talk a little bit about um, how we should approach that. So we'll uh, we'll take that on from another another angle. So stay tuned for that. Um, we traveled uh, 67,000 uh, miles today and um, it's, uh, it's 107,000 kilometers and that is 606 million bananas for scale. Thanks so much for our, to our, uh, to our panelists. Of course, we can't do this without you. We're having a lot of fun, by the way, if you want to come in early and see these panelists working away, um, I have a feeling it's going to have to start a little earlier because we only get through like three or four questions in the time frame that we gave ourselves. You don't have to come in. The panelists don't have to come in early. Um, but, uh, in a, you know, if you're some of our other panelists that may not even be able to make it for that day to be to be on the air, you're more than welcome to join us in the early the early chat. Um, I'm starting to get in. I'll, I'll probably be getting in at six because we just couldn't get, we're, we're getting nowhere at 6.15. <laughs> so, so anyway, so um, to just, and what we're doing is we're kind of hacking through some of the questions. So so if you ask the questions early um, uh, before, let's say, 530 in the morning, uh, 530 in the morning is when I start looking at questions. So so that's, you know, that, that's usually the, the time that I start reviewing the questions and figuring this out. Uh, it's much easier for us to, um, but, but we'll start talking about them as a group probably around six. Again, totally voluntary. Don't have to come in. But if you're somewhere else and you feel like jumping in and talking to us while we're going through that or, or just watching, you, you, it'll be opened in the in the area there's in the uh, in zoom in in the in the in the viewing room so you're you're more than welcome to listen to it it's a bit more informal than the show itself as we kind of dig through things and uh, we send out discords and emails and trying to figure out the the best answers for all of these things we're kind of turning into more of a grown-up show <laughs> like which is where we, we start doing this but, you know and um so uh so there'll be, there's a lot of research going on there so you'll see that and then it'll stop at mic checks at 6 30 and and uh you know we may or may not continue that but we're uh, going to um, at least do it for a half an hour. So stay tuned for that. All right. Um, thanks again for, to the panelists. Thanks again to the to the producers for all the great questions and keeping this. We can't really, I say we can't do the panelists, but we can't do it without the producers either. I mean, we don't really, you know, we need your questions. So um, so it's very important for you to come up here and ask those questions and vote on those questions. And then finally, of course, the incredible crew on the back end, um, both they're, the folks managing all the meetings. We have a lot of meetings about office hours every morning. And so thanks to the team that's putting that together. Thanks to the team that's doing all the infrastructure and dev. Thanks to the team that actually comes here live. There's just so many people involved uh, in what we're doing. And we just really appreciate all of your contribution. All right, let's jump into After Hours. Great second hour. So what is the frequency of whispering? I think it doesn't go above 500, right? I don't know. I, I think I'm going to, um, I have an Ambio mic. I'm thinking of taking it out this weekend. So we'll see. Let's see. Or we can capture. I gotta start You're kind of removing the vocal cords. I wonder if it has a frequency. I'm just, what is the frequency? To make a longer cable for that Ambio mic. Oh, I have it. I have it. I don't know where it is. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't buy the longer one. <laughs> somewhere i'm spelunking in the garage to, later this week to see if i can find it but yeah it's a little frustrating all right why 